Stay away, monsters. Stay away, ghouls. Stay away from Danny. You jerks know the rules. Halloween, Halloween, how lame are thee? Do you even know how to make a coherent theme? Do you know how to tell a story or rhyme? Or are you just wasting all of our time? Wait, that's a really good question. Are you wasting our time? I swear, Kaiju can write a better poem than what you gave this mom. By the way, Kaiju, if you plan to make me write another shit poem for another lackluster movie, I'm divorcing you. Woohoo! Asshole. <laughs> Remember to click like, subscribe, the bell notification, and whatever else YouTube has you clicking on to support us. At long last, the Cult of Thorn is finally here. Welcome. I am the Kaiju no Kami, and on this glorious Halloween night, I will be reviewing Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Halloween 5 had been met with lackluster results from both the box office returns and fan expectations. As such, producer Mustafa Akkad put the series on hold while he re-evaluated what went wrong with the fifth entry, and the franchise ended up in several legal disputes until Merrimax bought the rights to it. This finally got the gears rolling on the next entry, which was supposed to expand on the tattoo we saw on both the arms of Michael and the man in black, along with who that man was. Unfortunately, poor management from the studio meant that the film's script was always changing, and the version that ultimately been released in theaters strayed quite far from the original vision. These production issues also led to the recasting of Jamie Lloyd from being Daniel Harris to some nobody known as JC Brandy. Of course, it doesn't stop there as before the movie was officially released in theaters, test audiences were screening an entirely different cut of the film that was excessively different from what would be officially released. This edition would go on to become known as the producer's cut, and it became a hot commodity along the bootleg circle for years to come until finally it was released both in theaters and on Blu-ray. So which version am I going to treat you to? I'm going to primarily focus on the producer's cut while interjecting with aspects from the theatrical version when it occurs and when there's a big major part to talk about. A lot of it is just little bits and pieces. Though, for some reason, the theatrical cut has this need to throw in, like, these flash cuts. This is a mother's touch. Alright. Which version is superior? Well, let's dig into these films to find out. Halloween 6 opens to a girl on a stretcher about to give birth. That doesn't look like a very sanitary area to be having a baby in, now does it? No. She is brought into a chamber that appears to be surrounded by the priest from Mortal Kombat. It has begun! She gives birth, but the baby is taken by the man in black for some sort of ritual. Hey, at least we know the baby's circumcised. During this time, we also have some exposition from Donald Pleasance, giving a reason as to why Michael acted the way he did. He needed to wipe out his entire family. Because we all need a reason as to why a serial killer is a serial killer. Afterwards, we learn this girl's Jamie as she dream recaps the ending to the last film with the notion that the man in black also kidnapped her while they were taking Michael. Baby, come to me. A nurse barges into the room, frees Jamie, gives her back her baby, and proceeds to help her escape. Naturally, Michael confronts the nurse to tell her what she did was wrong. Yeah, baby, yeah!
I think she got the point. A long pursuit endures between Michael and Jamie leading them to a bus station, and then a farmhouse where Jamie possibly meets her demise. Of course, if you watch the theatrical cut, Jamie has no chance of living as Michael pretty much slices up her insides on some sort of farm equipment. During the span of this chase, we are also treated to a couple of introductions to our film's other characters. First, there is a boy named Danny Strode who is hearing voices in his head telling him to kill people. Danny. Danny. Kill for him. Are you my conscience? I... Yes, I am. His mom, Kara, played by Marianne Hagen, is the cousin of Laurie Strode and... Wait, is that a shit old Godzilla right there? Looks like it, and look! He's got the red Power Ranger figure too! I never owned that one because... Oh, yeah. Let's get back to the movie. Living across the street from Kara and Danny is a pre-Ant-Man Paul Rudd who calls into a radio show where a schlock DJ talks to people about Michael Myers where he reveals he is the grown-up version of Tommy Doyle from the first film. Does this wacko caller have a name? My name's Tommy. I was only eight years old when I saw him, but I was one of the lucky ones. In addition, the film also cuts to show us that Dr. Loomis is still alive as he is visited by his old friend from Smith's Grove, Terrence Wynn. Even so much as a sign for five miles on that road. <laughs> That's the beauty of the countryside. <laughs> I thrive on it. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You don't look like Terrence Wynn. He looks like an entirely different person. Sam Haddonfield is 150 miles away from here now. Now, for God's sakes, he can't drive a car. He was doing very well last night. Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. Also, where is Loomis's scar? I had uh, surgery, plastic surgery, uh, skin grafts. Oh, so that's how you lazily saved on makeup costs. Anyway, both Loomis and Tommy hear a distraught woman calling the radio station on the phone, claiming to be Jamie Lloyd. Hey, Dr. Loomis, are you out there? Can you hear me, Dr. Loomis? I need your please, help. Please, please, no, no, uh, please. Need... Stop the minute. What the hell is going on tonight? Tommy tracks her phone call down to the bus station where he finds the quietest baby in the world. At the same time, we are introduced to the rest of the Strode family. We've got the angry, abusive Father John. Yeah, just keep slipping her the cash. You know, while you're at it, I got a great idea. Here, here, why don't you give her all of our goddamn money? <laughs> what an asshole! The naive, petite mother Deborah. It's not about Kara, it's about you. I don't care what she's done, she's your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and the Beavis and Butthead wannabe brother Tim. <laughs> I think it's cool. Such a great family. Totally. Going back to Loomis and Wynn, Jamie is found and rushed to the hospital for immediate treatment. Tommy shows up to try to get help for the baby. I need to see a doctor. What seems to be the problem? Uh, it's my baby. It's There's been an accident. What kind of accident? <laughs> Get me a doctor now! Um, okay. Okay, that burst of anger was just random. He meets up with Loomis, informing the good doctor that he has to talk to him privately before he is chased away by security. Dr. Loomis, about Michael, it's just a theory of mine. But... Meet me tonight, 9 o'clock at the campus rally. Back at the Myers house, Deborah is killed off. Danny runs into Tommy on the street, who takes care of him until his mother returns home. Danny, go downstairs. But Tommy's my new friend, and he knows all about dinosaurs. He takes the duo to his room across the street to explain the new origin story of Michael. Among the ancient druids, Thorn represented a demon. So what you're saying is he's a thorny devil? One child from each tribe was chosen to be inflicted with the curse of Thorn. Uh-huh. To offer the blood sacrifices of its next of kin on the night of Samhain. Oh! The sacrifice of one family meant 
sparing the lives of an entire tribe. Interesting. For years I've been convinced there must be some reason, some method behind Michael's madness. And the common link I found is Thorn. Michael is now controlled by a demon. <laughs> oh, wait, you're serious. Let me laugh even harder. I traced it back to 1963. Then the next time was in 1978, but happened a decade later and the year after that. Now Jamie says Michael is back. Wow! You mean the stars have lined up every year there was a Halloween film? Who would have known that? During this time, Jamie is killed. Your work is done now, Jamie. But not before revealing who the baby daddy is. Yes, you heard that right. I said baby daddy because bad grammar is far less offensive to who the real father of this baby is. Michael, please don't hurt me. In addition, we also learn that Michael had a babysitter despite that totally being a contradiction to what is shown in the opening of the first film. I was babysitting with him that night. Little Mikey Myers that lived across the street. Michael's around someplace. I was babysitting with him that night. WRONG! Moving forward, John returns home to die. His death is quite shocking. Although, if you are watching the theatrical cut for this film, then his death is actually quite mind-blowing. Not really sure how that works, but okay. Likewise, the pompous jackass radio DJ we heard at the beginning of the movie is visiting Haddonfield, and he too is killed. Where the... Then Tim and his girlfriend meet their end after their makeout session. Tommy and Loomis meet up and return to the house just in time to learn who the man in black really is. Tim, no. No. Please. Win. Well, that's just dumb. You're telling me Wynn was the man in black and the guy who was helping Michael the entire time? Was he the one that gave Michael driving lessons then back in the first film? Oh, this movie is stupid. You have a way with understatements. It is also revealed that the old woman who owns the house Tommy rents is part of Wynn's cult. Hello, dear. Kara decides to jump out of the window for some reason. <laughs> Lewis and Tommy wake up after being drugged. Why not just kill them? Why didn't they just kill us? It's his game. You know what? At this point, you might as well just go with it. It's clear that the writers had no idea what they wanted to do, nor were they even trying. They make their way to Smith's Grove to save Kara, Danny, and the baby from the Cult of Thorn. Loomis is knocked out while Tommy follows a cult member into the altar room where some sort of sacrificial ritual is about to take place. Spirits and powers of the flame, attend and witness this ritual. Bear our gifts to Thorn. Fortunately, there just happens to be a spare robe conveniently hanging up right next to where Tommy is standing, allowing him to disguise himself. <laughs> Or not? Jesus. The cult from Hot Fuzz is far more threatening than you guys, and you have the original Jason Voorhees on your side. The, the trio flee from Michael and the cult, heading back upstairs where Tommy uses some rooms to freeze Michael. Sammy.
Tommy takes care of the children away from the facility while Loomis heads back to confront Michael. Zoinks! Wynn passes the thorn tattoo to Loomis, who shrieks relentlessly. <laughs> Michael walks away a free man. At least in this version. Let's take a look at the last quarter to the theatrical cut. After jumping out of the window, Kara finds herself locked in a room until Tommy comes to rescue her. He gets her out just as Michael is about to grab him, and the two run for their lives into an area where we see Wynn and a bunch of doctors are prepping some sort of operation. Okay, 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 you can take that off now. Halloween is over. Wait, so are they a cult or not? Because... If this isn't a cult, then that means I've been wasting my time. Whatever. Let's just continue. This version implies it was just a Halloween hoax, despite the opening of the film showing them in their robes. Wait, what do you mean there's no cult? Tommy and Kara grab the baby and Danny and run. Michael pursues our leads into a lab full of dead babies or something. Tommy jams Michael full of drugs and beats him to a bloody pulp with a pipe while everyone escapes. Loomis stays behind, though we don't know why, he just stands there watching them drive off before the camera cuts to Michael's mask and blood on the ground as we hear Loomis screech with no context as to why. <laughs> Thus bringing an end to this disaster. At least it wasn't as boring as Five. Regardless of what version you watch, the movie ends on a giant whimper rather than the satisfying conclusion fans originally waited years to see. Both versions are terrible. Kinda like both cuts of Alien 3, but with even more suckitude. Yet, I do think the producer's cut is the superior of the two as the pacing is a tad better and the ending sucks a bit less. The cult aspect just works so much better with what the rest of the film was conveying compared to the theatrical version just making it a hoax at the last minute. Not to mention the producer's cut gives us several more scenes of Loomis as Donald Pleasance was by far the only actor in this film trying to give it his all. It just stinks that this had to be his final performance as the man deserved to go out with a much better movie. Furthermore, I'm honestly surprised Paul Rudd managed to scrape up a career after this as he was more wooden than a rainforest. Though that might not be his fault as the dialogue is just awful all around, most of the characters act like jerks in one form or another, making it hard for the viewer to care if they live or die. Then you have the retcons dealing with the previous movies. Did anyone involved with this film even watched the previous ones? Michael's sister was his babysitter, not the old lady in this one. Next, we have the Myers house changing yet again, but I guess at least this time it looked like it could have been the old house compared to the castle the last movie had. I do have to give the filmmakers credit though for at least filming all three movies in the same area. It at least kept that aspect of continuity together. Too bad the same couldn't be said for Jamie's actress since they stupidly chose to go with someone else. As shown earlier, there are quite a lot of differences in the narrative and a couple of deaths between the theatrical and producer's cuts of the movie. However, there's a lot more even from a production standpoint, as the soundtrack is quite different. Alan Holworth did a more traditional Halloween score with the producer's cut, whereas a man named Paul Robgins rescored a lot of the movie for the theatrical version.
He was kind enough to let Holworth assist him in the endeavor by adding more guitar riffs and drum beats to his work. At the end of the day, the theatrical score is quite terrible as it doesn't always fit with the movie compared to the producer's cut. If there is one positive I can give the Curse of Michael Myers, it's that at least they got a much better looking mask for Michael to wear compared to the last few films. In the end, the Curse of Michael Myers flat out sucks. It doesn't matter how many cuts you do, how much you slice it up and re-edit scenes, you can't polish a turd. You can't fix what is completely unfixable. There's a reason this movie was retcon from continuity and the ones that preceded it. It's a garbage film, not worth your time unless you are an absolute die-hard Halloween fan. Although, like I said, at least it isn't as boring as the fifth one. Mommy, it's raining. It's raining red. Mommy, it's raining red. Mommy, it's raining. It's raining red. It's raining red. Mommy, it's raining red. I hope you have enjoyed this year's Halloween month. Tell me what you liked. Did you like this movie? Which cut do you like? Put them all in the comments section. And until next time, bye. Where do we go now? I don't know. Maybe take some acting classes?